I, I didn't plan this, by the way. Pastor John asked me if I wanted to come up here, so I'm, I'm just kind of just talking to you guys as, as my family, as my friends. I love you guys. Um, as I was saying to a few folks in between the sessions, you know, when I came to Southern California, um, I found this church not too long after that, and this church has been has been the foundation of, of my time here. And when I look back on my time in Southern California, it will be, um, it will be about this church. And uh, so I want to thank each and every one of you who have played a part in, in my life, a major, major part. I think back to the beginning, Ken and Dan were so helpful, and, and Denise and Joseph, and of course, Pastor John and Lori and Barry and Syl, and, and then as of late, Garrett and, and Mrs. Kaler and Lori, and um, so many more. Uh, forgive me, I, I'm, just, I'm not going to go through names because I won't remember everybody, but um, just thank you. Um, we love you guys, and uh, I just wanted to um, just share one verse that came to my mind while uh, Henry was singing. Second Corinthians, the Apostle Paul was in a tough spot, probably the toughest time of his, of his ministry. In, second, in, in chapter 7, um, you see his struggle here. He, verse 5, he says, For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. But we were troubled on every side, with outward fightings, within were fears. And I'm in no way, shape, or form comparing my situation to the Apostle Paul's, my wife, you know. But, but it has kind of felt like with outer fightings, within are fears lately yeah. for us, um, especially for me. <laughs> my wife is, I think, handling it a little better. But um, look what he says in the next verse. He says, Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by how? By the coming of Titus. And I want you to know that you have been a comfort to me um, in, in, at many different times in many different ways. I know that you pray for us, and, and, and we pray for you guys, and, and you're in our hearts. And so the Lord has used you in our life, and I want to thank you for that. We will be online. We'll be visiting. This isn't the, the absolute end. Um, so, and uh, thanks so much. And Pastor John. Love you, buddy. Love you. Many of you have heard Brother Nathan uh, teach and preach from the Word of God on a number of different occasions, you know what a blessing that that has been. He's going to be teaching up at the Idaho Bible Conference, so we're super thankful and grateful for that. So, um, and that's coming up the 17th of June, coming up about three weeks away or so forth. So it'd be a great place to come and enjoy the fellowship around the Word of God, see Nathan and his wife and the other saints as well again. But Nathan, you've meant uh, so much to us and the ministry here. We really appreciate that. Nathan, Brother Nathan's been through and is a graduate of Grace School of the Bible. So anywhere he goes, he's going to have a grace ministry. And that's initially what he started literally right, I mean, just what right before the COVID hit last year, yeah. he was going to open up a grace church in Murrieta out there. We were going to have a potluck here, kind of a send off for the ministry and so forth. And it just, COVID came and just wrecked everything as it were, and, uh, and then like, as he mentioned, some things have uh, changed and some different cir situations, circumstances. If you want to talk with him further about that, you can, you can do so. But well, we're sure going to miss you and you know, give all of our love to your dear sweet wife, Carrie, and, and uh, wherever they go, they're going to have a ministry. You're going to preach the word of God right out of a King James Bible. Amen. You know that for sure about that man. <laughs> so, and so we stand together, even though physically we might be a distance apart, we stand together. And what the Word of God has done in his soul and continues to do in our soul, all of us here today and everyone listening by over the internet, that, that, that's what the Word of God will do in a heart that believes it. And that's why we just, listen, I was talking to Steve, one of the elders of the church, Steve, this morning, and that I, I know there's a lot of things that, as a ministry here that we maybe could do different or better, and you know, we're always trying to think about things like that. And, but I, I, will, I will never be ashamed never for almost what 39 years now preaching out of the king james bible the word of god rightly divided i am never going to back off of that by god's help you know as soon as you say never then of course you're dependent on your flesh and it reminds me of peter saying lord i'll never deny you so <laughs> by god's grace and by god's help help that we as a ministry are always going to stand for out of the king james bible in the english language preaching the word of god rightly divided that just so you know 
if I ever get off track from that, what you do is you, you, you knock me upside the head. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Say, John, what are you doing? Let's get back to the book, back, back to the Word of God rightly divided, because it's the Word of God rightly divided in a King James Bible. That's what produces spiritual stability in a human soul. Amen. That's what it does. And that's what we're going to give an account for at the judgment seat of Christ. And yes, we are going to the judgment seat of Christ as believers, okay? And that's what we will give an account for. It's not something to fear and that type of thing. It is something to when we stand before the Lord to say, Lord, let your word be glorified. And it will be at the judgment seat of Christ. That which is not gold, silver, and precious stones, he's going to, in grace, burn it up. That's a good thing I'm telling you. That's a wonderful thing. To all those things that we did that were just in our flesh or wrong doctrine and so forth, his grace is going to burn all that up so it will never haunt you again. Truly going to be wonderful as we think about that. So, but... Um, so praise God for his wonderful work in all of our hearts, our lives together. And I'm speaking also to those by way of the internet. We're so thankful for you guys being a part of, uh, a part of the ministry here today. Let's, um, let's uh, open our Bibles today, if you would, over... We're going we're gonna to be in the book of Hebrews, as it were. Now, I'll tell you what, let's, let's do something different. Let's go, go with me to Mark chapter number 1. Go to Mark chapter number 1. And then um, look over to Mark chapter number 1, if you would. And let's, let's begin with the word of prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we're grateful that we can take the time today to look into your word and doing so knowing that we really do have your word, your perfect, infallible, and errant word here in our, in our Bibles, in our language in the King James Bible. We ask, Father, as we continue to study it, that our hearts would again be compelled by your love for us, by your goodness and your kindness to us. By the way, that, that you have in time saw fit to put down in words your very thinking, your heart, your purposes, your plans, and in doing so have disclosed to all humanity, to all the angels, have disclosed the, your purpose for being, your purpose for living, and that is, of course, to glorify our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask, Father, that as we continue to study your word this morning, especially looking at the death and resurrection of Christ, that we would appreciate to a greater degree its impact, not just in our lives, but also and in particular in the prophecy program. And we'll thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to start today here in Mark chapter number one. Just real quickly, a little bit of review. You see Mark chapter number one, verse 14, it says this, now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching, notice it says, the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, our lesson today, this I believe is number six, and lesson number six, maybe number seven, in this present series, where we're looking at the cross in prophecy, i.e., chart closed, and mystery, i.e. chart open, okay? We've spent the last several weeks focusing especially on the issue of the death and resurrection of Christ as it pertains to the Prophecy Kingdom program. And one of the reasons that we're doing this is to be able to clearly see and understand the, a, a, a significant difference between the gospel of the grace of God, which someone has to believe to be justified today, and the gospel of the kingdom. And what we have seen so far over the last six, six weeks now, I think, is that, six weeks, is that, that when the Lord Jesus Christ began to tell the disciples that he was going to go die and rise again three days later, what was their response to that? Doubt. Yeah, they, Peter himself said, this shall not be unto thee. And, and then even after his death and resurrection, when Peter preached about the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ in Acts chapter 2 and 3, which last week we looked at chapter 3, the previous week we looked at chapter 2, remember that? We read almost the whole chapter, both chapters, okay? When Peter did preach the death and resurrection of Christ, did he preach it as good news? Instead, he preached it in what sense? Yeah, it was an indictment. They crucified the Lord of glory, 
And if, if, if way back in, in the days of David, prior to him being king, when he had an opportunity to, to, to slay Saul, who was the king, who was trying to kill David, David himself said, far be it that I should slay the Lord's anointed. And yet when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the, Lord's anoint, he's the anointed of the Father, and Israel slew the prince of life, but God raised him from the dead. So when you, when, when you see even after the death and resurrection of Christ, when the apostles are preaching about that fact, that historical fact, they still are not preaching it in early Acts as the fundamental central issue they needed to believe at that time in order to be justified. It's really amazing to think about that, okay? When they preached the death and resurrection of Christ in Acts chapter number two and Acts chapter number three, he was raised from the dead, who remembers why, to, to do it, to sit on David's throne. He ascended to the Father's right hand in fulfillment of Psalms 110, verse 1. He therefore was the Lord who was going to come back and make his enemies his footstool. So when the audience in Acts chapter number 2 hears that and realizes that, and they say, men and brethren, what shall we do? In response to the fact that we killed our Messiah, God raised him from the dead, he's the Christ, to sit on David's throne, and he's the Lord, going to come back and make his enemies his footstool. What shall we do? What does Peter tell them? Remember, look, look over to Acts 2.38 real quick. Yeah, repent and be baptized. Was water baptism required in that program? Was water baptism required in that program? Everybody say yes, because it was. Okay, Absolutely. And then even in Acts chapter number 3, when Peter preaches about the death and resurrection of Christ, um, he tells them to repent. In fact, look over to chapter... We didn't read Acts 2.38, did we? Go to Acts 2.38 real quick. 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then the context is, what shall we do to be saved from the great notable day of the Lord is the context. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So water baptism clearly is required there. You go to chapter number uh, 3, when Peter tells them in chapter number 3, they killed the prince of life. See verse, verse 14? He says, Ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the prince of life whom God hath raised from the dead, wherever we are witnesses. So they are witnesses of his death and resurrection, yes? Peter tells them to repent. Jump down to verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted. What does the word repent mean? Change your mind. It means change your mind. So when he tells them to repent, change their mind about what? That Christ was the yeah, about who they thought Christ was. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, and then what's the next word? When. That's a good word. And you want to read it, not just, you want to read it like, well, when, <laughs> right? When were their sins going to be blotted out? When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. That's the second coming of Jesus Christ. Do you see in the setting here, in the context, the Holy Spirit through the mouth of Peter right here, what is he offering to Israel if they would repent? He's well, no, let me say it differently. Why is he telling them they need to repent? They need to repent because Christ is going to come back. And he's going to make his enemies his footstool. And if they want to be his friends instead of his enemies, they need to repent about who they thought he was. And that's when, at a second coming, that's when they would receive the forgiveness of their sins. Everybody see that there? Yep. Let me ask it this way. Does this sound like the gospel of the grace of God? No. Do, do you see that? Yeah. Do everybody understand that? Does this sound like when you go out and you're sharing the gospel with someone and in your discussion with that individual, you, you, you discern from what they say that you know, they've never really trusted Christ for their personal salvation, you explain to them their, their need, their sinful condition. You explain to them why Christ and how Christ is the solution, what he did at Calvary, God raised him from the dead. And then you ask that person, would, would you like 
to, to trust the Lord Jesus Christ personally right now to, to save you. So in asking them that question and in presenting the gospel of the grace of God to them, what are you saying to them that if, if they will believe the gospel right then, right there, what are you saying God will do to them and for them? Several things, but number one. He'll Several things. Number one, what? He'll forgive, them of all your sins. forgive you of all your sins right there on the spot forever. You said several. Keep going. <laughs> okay. Going to make you complete in Him right there. Accept in eternal love. Life not get eternal life. Accept it in the beloved. Raymond, what would you say? I'm sorry. Seal with the Holy Spirit of promise. Sanctify. Listen. Right there on the spot. Give him Lori's book. Give him Lori's book, he says. Okay. So, so when you share the gospel of the grace of God with someone, you're not quoting Psalm 16 that God raised him from the dead to sit on David's throne. When you share the gospel of the grace of God with someone, you're not quoting Psalms 110 verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand until I make the enemies that footstool. When you're, when you're sharing the gospel of the grace of God with that individual, you're not saying repent and believe so that you can get the forgiveness of your sins when the Father sends Jesus Christ back to this earth to be king on the earth. It, it, it's different. It's not the same information. By the way, it's all good news, except if you're the enemy at Psalm 110 verse 1, he's going to make his enemies his footstool. But it's not the same thing. When you're reading Acts chapter 2 and chapter 3, you are seeing how the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of Peter, is presenting the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to his nation. Everybody get that point there. So we need to ask a question. By the way, all that's review. All that's review. We need to ask a question that in the prophecy program, let me just erase this up here. here here's kind of the question and the title, okay? Is the death, I'm going to go D, B, R. What is that? D, B, R. Okay. Is the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, is it good news in the prophecy program? Yes. Well, yes and no. Yes and let, me, let me make sure I say it this way again. Let me ask it this way. It was the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ prophesied. Yes. Yes. Like, like what, what passages would you go to? Cl classic passages would be what? Isaiah 53, Psalm 16, Psalms 22. Those would be some of the chief passages. Psalm 69 would be another one. Okay. Isaiah 53, the suffering Lamb of God and so forth. Psalm 16, the race from the dead, and so forth. Psalm 69, where he talks about that his soul is going into the waters of the depth, as it were. So was the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ prophesied, and therefore is it clearly connected with the prophecy kingdom program? Shake yes. your head yes. yes. Was the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ in the prophecy program, was it therefore actually good news? The answer is a gigantic yes. yes. So how come then the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter number 2 is not presenting the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ to his guilty nation there in, they're heading into the tribulation period there in early Acts. How come the Holy Spirit isn't having Peter jump up and down and say, guys, this is good news. He died for our sins. According to Christ was buried and rose again. How come he's not preaching it that way? One is they crucified them by wicked hands instead of holy hands. Yes, Garrett, did you? Okay, okay. You see, he wanted Israel to understand the seriousness of what they did in terms of when they killed the prince of life. So where then in the prophecy program does God come along and explain in great detail 
the purpose, the meaning, how it all fits in the prophecy program, how the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ really is good news, and how it all fits in the prophecy kingdom program. Where, in which New Testament book do you think? Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is exactly right. But think about that. How many chapters in the book of Hebrews? It's an open book test. You can look. He takes 13 chapters, as it were, to present to Israel how they should look at the prophesied event of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. He takes, you got 13 chapters in this amazing book of Hebrews to the Hebrews. There's a real parallel in this way that just like the Apostle Paul, okay, Ken, I'll open the chart here, okay? Just like the Apostle Paul in the Dispensation of Grace takes the book of Romans, and not only Romans, but takes the book of Romans and explains the cross to the nations. How God has this, had this secret, hidden purpose in the cross that He did not disclose through the prophets. It takes the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans and Galatians and Corinthians to explain the cross to the world in the dispensation of grace. In the Prophecy Kingdom program, it takes the book of Hebrews to take and disclose in extended detail the purpose, the meaning behind, the reason for the very death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So next time you're out sharing the gospel with someone, say, I only need about five minutes of your time I got to read the whole book of Hebrews to you. Okay, that's not going to work, okay? <laughs> kind of a concept. But what we are going to do then this morning, we're going to look at some, some significant passages in the book of Hebrews where the writer of Hebrews does explain to Israel how they should view the death and resurrection of Christ, and indeed how God views it. Garrett, go ahead. That's exactly correct. Exactly correct. Israel was, it's, it's, you know, this has come up actually a couple of times through this study. I'm going to have to do a study just on Psalms 118 by itself. We'll, we'll, we'll do that, maybe. <laughs> okay. Israel really was supposed to offer their Messiah by holy hands, not by wicked hands. They were supposed to follow the pattern of Abraham, their father, who by faith offered Isaac. Abraham wasn't offering him by wicked hands. He was going to offer him by holy hands, accounting that God would raise him from the dead. And that's exactly what the high priest in Israel should have done when that leper that Christ healed, right at the beginning of Christ's ministry, heals the leper and he tells the leper, go thy way and show thyself to the priest. He says, don't go stop anywhere. Don't go tell your mom, your dad, your kids, your cousins. Don't go by your boss's office. Don't, 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 don't post it on Facebook. Go to the priest and show the priest what happened, and offer the gift that Moses commanded, and it says it's for a testimony unto them, to the priests. And what the priests should have done, they should have questioned, they should have interrogated that man. Wait a minute, who did this to you? What did he do? What did he say? Take me to that man. I have some questions for that man. And when they wound up, when that guy said it was this guy named Jesus of Nazareth, when they found Jesus, uh, that guy should have had a whole checklist of questions to ask Jesus of Nazareth. Who are you? Who are you? What's your lineage? Who's your mom? Who's your dad? What city were you born in? What's your history? And so forth. And then they should have watched the Lord Jesus Christ for the next three years. Watched him perform the signs, the miracles and wonders, the evidence of the statement that he made that the kingdom of heaven was at hand all pointing to the fact that this is your Messiah. John the Baptist himself, early in his ministry, said, Behold, there goes the Lamb of God. There goes the one to take an offer by holy hands. But I, I, I'm preaching the wrong message this morning, aren't I? <laughs> okay, we'll preach that at some point. But it back to the topic here today is, in the Prophecy Kingdom program, how were they supposed to look 
how were they supposed to view the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? Well, go with me, if you would, to... Man, there's so many wonderful places that we could point to in the book of Hebrews, but there's one that seems to me to stand out more than any other chapter in the book of Hebrews about his death and resurrection, and it is, of course, Hebrews chapter number 10. So I want you to follow along with me now, get to Hebrews chapter number 10. We're going to, going to read a good portion of this chapter here, and we'll kind of comment as we go. It, it takes the book of Hebrews to explain the death and resurrection of Christ to them, how it fulfills not just specific prophecies, but the very types of, and, and figures of the various sacrifices in the Old Testament. It tells them that this is, again, additional evidence, the most essential evidence that Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, was the Messiah, the very Son of God, who came and fulfilled those scriptures and the types. So look at chapter 10, verse 1. He says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image. That's the first thing to appreciate about what he, how, how, how this chapter starts. The law had a shadow and not the image. The law had types and pictures, but not the very image. All the shadows and types, the pictures, the various sacrifices, they were supposed to bring, if they sinned, they were supposed to bring a lamb or a goat, and they were supposed to take and place their hands on the head of that animal identifying themselves with that animal, identifying the reason that they brought that sacrifice is because of the particular sin that they did. And then the priest was to take that animal and they were to slit the throat of the animal, the blood would be spilt, and then the animal would be sacrificed. Do you see some types and shadows and pictures there? You see identification. You see substitution. You see the blood being spilt. You see the sacrifice being burnt. He's seen a sweet savor unto God. And he tells them, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things. What are the next two words? Amen. Can, how often? Never. Can never. With those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, it can never make the comers there unto perfect. There's a basic problem with those sacrifices in that there was a lack of ability to perfect the soul, to provide pure, total forgiveness of sins. Look at what he goes on to say. For then, in other words, if it did make the comers there unto perfect, would they not have ceased to be offered? Think about what he just said there. If those sacrifices could make the presenter, the offerer, perfect in their conscience, giving them an understanding of total forgiveness of sins, then they would have ceased to offer them. Everybody see the logic there? And in ceasing to offer them, what would they be recognizing? What's that? Well, or that the, that the sacrifice accomplished what was necessary to make them perfect. But it didn't do that. That's why they had to keep offering. He said, for then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers, not twice purged, or 20 times purged, or 50 times purged, but once purged, should have had no more conscience of sins. In other words, there would have been an appreciation of the fact of the value of the sacrifice in relationship to its ability to give them total forgiveness once for all. But it didn't do that. Verse 3, but in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Those sacrifices kept saying what? You're a sinner. It kept reminding them about their failures. It kept reminding them of their accountability. There's a remembrance, a remembrance, a remembrance. You know, think about, it's, what kind of, how depressing would that be to have to constantly be reminded about your failures? 
By the way, if you find yourself in that situation, it's because you're putting yourself under the law. So don't. <coughs> Live under grace. Stop, stop dealing with yourself that way. Stop dealing with yourself as though you're Israel under the law. He says at verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should do what? So you know from verse 1 through 4, you know that the fundamental issue was in those, in those sacrifices, there was no way by the blood of bulls and goats to give them total forgiveness of sins. And as they could ever, never have that, that purified conscience, they never could see themselves accepted in God's eyes. So now watch this. Wherefore, when he, the he is the Lord Jesus Christ right there. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith. So he, when Christ came into the world, his coming into the world said the following. And he came into the world in relationship to the prophecy program, the chart being closed. He came into the world in connection to the prophecy program. That's the context here. So when he came into the world, here's what he said. He said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, that is, God wouldn't accept, uh, but a body hast thou prepared me. Well, why? Keep reading. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for, for sins thou hast had no pleasure. Why? Why did the justice of God find no pleasure in the blood of bulls and goats? How come? In the context. Because it didn't solve the problem. It couldn't take away sin. It could, it could not provide a just Righteous, holy payment for sin. Seven. Then said I, the I is the Lord Jesus Christ, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me, and I come to do thy will, O God. Above, when he saith, sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, that is, he wouldn't accept from, from a justice standpoint, neither had pleasure, and he wouldn't accept them because they didn't pay for sin judicially, which are offered by the law. Then, verse 9 now, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Question, back to verse 5. Did you see the reference when he said, But a body hast thou prepared me? Christ entering into the world was saying that extended statement there. Christ, the living eternal word of God, entered into a body, a body that was prepared. Prepared for what? Prepared for what? To be the sacrifice to fulfill the types and shadows, to be the very image of what those types and shadows in the Old Testament kept picturing, kept displaying. Now when it says, go back to verse 7, Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written to me, to do, watch this, to do thy will. Jump to verse 9. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will. What will? What was the will of God that he's referring to in these verses right here? Go, go back to verse 9. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. What's the first there? That's the Mosaic Covenant. That old covenant given at Sinai. What's the second? That's the promise of the new covenant. Promised in Jeremiah 31. In the context here, when he says, Lord, I've come to do thy will, what was God's will for which he came in a body to become a sacrifice. It was God's will to do away, to take away the Mosaic Covenant as the basis upon which he would deal with Israel and to put them under the New Covenant, which would write the law in their heart. The context is very clear here, that the purpose of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to the prophecy of program was in relationship to the establishment, I'm just going to go establishment of 
the new covenant. Everybody see that there? That's how they're to look at the death and resurrection of Christ. They're, they're to say, well, the blood of bulls and goats under the Old Testament, Old Covenant, that could never take away my sins. That could never give me a right standing in the eyes of God. And so the Messiah, the Son of God, the person the whole book of Hebrews is about, came to do God's will. That is, to, to, to take away that Old Covenant, to put them under the New Covenant, to give them a means, a method, that God would be, His justice would be satisfied with a sacrifice, indeed the sacrifice, upon which God could and would forgive their sins at the second coming of Christ. Now we're tied right back to Acts chapter number 2. Uh, 3, I'm sorry, chapter 3. Remember that? So he says it this way. Uh, look at Hebrews 10 there. Hebrews 10 and verse 10, it says, By the which will we are sanctified. I'm sorry, go back to verse 9. It says, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that's the covenant given at Mount Sinai, that he may establish the second. That's the new covenant for Israel. By the which will. What will? The will to take away the first that he might establish the second. The will to take them out from under the Mosaic Covenant and put them under the New Covenant. By that will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ how many times? Once for all. Under that Old Covenant, let's, let's just do it this way. Let's just do it this way. Under the Old Covenant, how many sacrifices were there? I mean, you can't even count. Nonstop, daily. Oftentimes, daily, the same sacrifices. Under what Christ did, under the new covenant, what, how many sacrifices were there going to be? There was going to be one. His. Okay? One sacrifice. His sacrifice upon which the justice of God could and would receive them. So, Christ came to, to do and to fulfill God's will in taking Israel out from under the obligation that they failed to keep of the Old Testament, Old Covenant, so that he could place them and deal with them under the New Covenant. See that there? And watch him go on to say. This time, verse 11. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Did we already see in this chapter those two words, can never, can never, can never, back in verse 1? So over under this system here, you've got the priests who daily offer oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. See the repetitive nature of that, and yet it still didn't work. It could never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, what did he do? What's the great difference between what the priests, plural, are doing in verse 11 and what he, as their high priest, did in verse 12? These guys are standing... He sat down, indicating what? Under, the, under this system over here, you can never sit down. Under, under this system, he sat down because the Father accepted his work on their behalf in relationship to the, prom, to the promise of the new covenant. He says, for, uh, verse 12, but, uh, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, his footstool for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. What, was God going to be able to sanctify them under the old covenant? Why not? Because Yeah, because they, they didn't keep it. So God promised a new covenant in which the blessing was going to be based upon God's integrity, not their lack of ability to, to keep it. And he tells them this. Look at verse 
15 now. He says, Wherefore, the Holy Ghost also is witness to us. Look, all the way through this here, you have God the Father, God the Son, and now God the Holy Spirit witnessing to the Hebrews as to how they should view the death and resurrection of Christ. Why was it necessary? What is it connected to? What should they link it to? And watch what he witnesses to. Verse 15, Wherefore the Holy Ghost also is witness to us, for after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. What covenant is that? That's the new covenant. Verse 17, And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Okay, let's ask it this way. How, therefore, were the Hebrews to view the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? It was clearly prophesied. How are they to view it? Are they to be going out to fellow Israelites and saying, hey, if you'll just trust the shed blood of Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, God will save you? Is that? No. I mean, I'm kind of reading down through here and I don't see him presenting it that way. But was the cross, was the death and resurrection of Christ good news? Of course it was. What did it do? It took away the first, that old covenant, so that he could establish the second, the new covenant. And that he's going to do at his second coming. They are to look at the death and resurrection of Christ as, as the image, not the shadows. All those sacrifices, the, the shedding of the, the, lamb, the, the blood's lamb, the laying on of the hands, the identification, they're going to say, they're looking to say, wow, none of those sacrifices could ever take away sins. But his sacrifice is the one sacrifice as to why and how God can and will take away Israel's sins under that new covenant at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing now? It's, it's really something how he says this here. He says, verse 19, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest, how? Not by the blood of bulls and goats, but by the blood of Christ. I'm going to jump down for time's sake. We're going to go down to verse 26. By the way, I, I do want you to notice something back in chapter number 8, and then we'll get right back to chapter 10. Look at chapter 8, verse 13. Chapter 8, verse 13 says this, In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. So in other words, as soon as God, through the mouth of the prophet Jeremiah, even made the statement that I'm going to make you a new covenant, that instantly made the other one old just by making a statement, okay? But that verse says, the, the, the second verse of verse 13 says, now that which decayeth and waxes old, okay, which, which one is that? That's the old covenant. And then it says, is already gone. Right, that's not what your Bible said, and it's not what my Bible said. That verse says it's what? So at the time the book of Hebrews was written, was the new covenant in, in effect. At the time the book of Hebrews was written, was the new covenant functioning in Israel, the nation? No. At the time the book of Hebrews was written, had the nation already received the total forgiveness of all their sins? The answer is no, no, no. That verse says it was, the book of Hebrews is telling them that that new covenant, I'm sorry, that the old covenant is ready to vanish away. The new covenant is not in effect yet, but because of Christ's death and resurrection, what he did on the cross there, he established that covenant which was necessary in order to bring it into effect. And it will be brought into effect at the second coming of Jesus Christ. By the way, you, you do realize you're not under the new covenant today in the dispensation of grace. You, you know that, right? We don't have any covenant. It's really amazing. Now go back to chapter number 10 and then you've got, you got to make the connection with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ to the new covenant. And you and I as Gentiles, we were strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. 
Garrett, go ahead quickly, and then Nathan, go ahead. Would that have been at the end of the pre-election period? Yes. At the end of the line? Very great question. Uh, Garrett's question was, uh, meaning when he, when he brings the new covenant, his question was, was, was that going to be at the end of the tribulation period or at the end of the millennium? It's going to be at his second coming at the end of the tribulation period. That's when he would bring it in. That's when he would put it into effect for the nation. Uh, Nathan, you had a question or a comment there quickly? Just exactly what he said. He's telling, he told them at, at, at the Last Supper and so forth, he says, this is my blood of the New Covenant, the New Testament, as it were, which is shed for many. It was shed for Israel for the purpose of dealing with them under the New Covenant. Look with me to Hebrews 10 real quickly. And I, I know we're out of time, so we'll do this kind of quickly. Uh, Hebrews chapter number 10. What, watch, watch what he says. Look at uh, uh, 10 verse 25. He says, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. By the way, that has nothing to do with you meeting in a local church each week. But at any rate, it says, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see what? The day approaching. They were, going, they were heading into that tribulation period. That means the return of Christ to bring the kingdom, to bring the new covenant, to place them under the new covenant. It was approaching. They had to look, to look forward to that in anticipation, excitement. And he says, look at verse 26 now. He says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth. What's that? The willful sin that that verse is talking about, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, the truth about what? That Christ was their Messiah. He died fulfilling Scripture so that He could do away with the old covenant to bring them under the new covenant in which they would have forgiveness of sins, be accepted in the eyes of God as kings and priests and so forth. That's the knowledge of the truth that they receive. And He says, if, if we sin willfully, that is, if we reject that information, guess what? There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. You're going to go back to the blood of bulls and goats that could never give forgiveness of sins in the first place. There is no other sacrifice, he's saying. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fire indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Think of Psalms 110, verse 1. He's going to set at the Father's right hand until he makes his enemies his footstool. See the connection there? Understand this. How fu fundamentally then, how were they to view the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? Were they to view the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as the very central heart of their personal, individual justification at the moment that they believed it, that they would be right in the eyes of God? That's, it's interesting. That, that's not how Hebrews presents it. Hebrews presents the death and resurrection of Christ as the very, the very image of the shadows and types of the Old Testament, the, the blood of bulls and goats that could never take away sin. He came, offered his blood that, that can and will take away sin in connection with God's will to take away the first, the Mosaic Covenant, to put them under the second, the New Covenant. So therefore, in connection with his return to this earth to establish a literal physical kingdom on this planet in which they would truly receive forgiveness, they would be kings and priests, and they would rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ on this earth forever. Isn't that amazing? Amen. So I ask again, was the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ prophesy, prophecy? Was it spoken about by the prophets? Shake your head, yes. Was it good news? Yes. Yes. But as Paul explains the cross of Christ for the dispensation of grace, is it the same good news as Hebrews presents the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for the prophecy kingdom program? Both are good news. The details are different because the dispensations are different. The information is different. Okay. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you that we can take the time to look into your word this morning and to, again, appreciate the nature, the wonderful good news about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And, 
even though the specific details here in Revelation are not the good news about the dispensation of your grace to us Gentiles, still it's wonderful news here to see how the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't the shadow, he was the image. It wasn't the types and the figures, he was the real sacrifice. And the real sacrifice for what you disclosed through the prophets, and then we now know through the ministry of the Apostle Paul given to him by Christ, that Christ died also, gave himself a ransom for all, and hence for us as well. We thank you for that precious truth in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.